Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will try to talk about how one can use the structure, structural studies of the ribosome to not understand, not only understand how it works to synthesize proteins, but for making new antibiotics, addressing that problem that uh, Thank you, Ramakrishnan, uh, just, just brought up. And I will talk about how a company that uh, <clears throat> I and some of my colleagues founded 10 years ago uh, is being successful in making new antibiotics using our, our work. And I, I, I'm sort of echoing what uh, uh, Dr. Chavi said in his first lecture, namely that basic research can lead to translation, and not just translation of messenger RNA into proteins, but uh, translation into practical applications. So we started working on the ribosome only because we wanted to understand how the ribosome worked and, and ribosome function, and it led, uh, has led now to being able to use this structure to uh, develop new antibiotics. And so I will try to uh, take that pathway. I'm going to go into a bit more uh, detail uh, uh, than Venki Ramakrishnan did. So here's the problem. I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of it. Uh, this was published in the New York Times in the end of 2007. Uh, at that time it said 19,000 deaths in U.S. hospitals alone. Uh, from methicillin resistant staph warriors. I'm told that now, worldwide, it's about 100,000 deaths a year. Very large problem. The other problem is that new antibiotics that are being approved has dropped from, this is 2003, 2007, or 83 to 87, sorry. Uh, and more recently, you can see that the number of antibiotics approved for use has dropped to uh, three or two or three. Big problem. And there was an article in the New York Times just uh, a month ago saying maybe the National Institutes of Health should be providing money to help in funding. Uh, the development of new antibiotics. I mean, that's a complicated issue to say the least, but this is a major problem. So that's where I want to wind up. How did we address it? But let's uh, start a little bit more in the beginning. I'm not going to give as much background uh, as to how we got into uh, this area as the previous uh, speakers have, uh, but what we've been working on uh, for the last uh, more than three decades in my laboratory is exploring the structural basis for what's called Crick's central dogma, DNA makes DNA makes RNA protein. That is how, how is DNA copied into DNA? What's the, what is the molecular mechanism for that? And then how, how is that DNA uh, copied into messenger RNA? And then the final step, which is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, and what uh, Venki talked about, is how is how is it that the ribosome is able to translate that message that's encoded in the genome, translates that into proteins. <clears throat> and as Venki said, the small subunit uh, does what's called the decoding, gets the right tRNA on the right uh, anti-codon, or on the right codon, and what the large subunit does is attach an amino acid that's um, attached initially to the A site tRNA, attach it to the growing polypeptide that is it forms a polypeptide bond, and that's what it's catalyzing, that reaction, and then this chain grows. And so 
what I'm going to talk about primarily is, first of all, how does this happen? That's the basic thing that ribosomes do. And then secondly, how do antibiotics stop this process? And then thirdly, how can we use this information to develop new antibiotics? So, uh, as Becky said, Jim Watson's group was working on the, on the ribosome in the 60s when I was a graduate student at Harvard. And this is a figure that Watson made in 1964 showing the state of knowledge about translation at that time. Again, knowing the large and small subunit and knowing that the tRNA, whose structure wasn't known at that time, had this anticodon that interacted with the codon, an amino acid on this tRNA, and a growing polypeptide on the second tRNA called the P-site tRNA, <coughs> peptide bond formation, and then translocation. You saw the detailed movie of that uh, in the previous talk. But there were a lot of things that weren't known. Obviously, there's no detail here about the, the molecular mechanisms. Uh, Jim had lots of insights, but he didn't realize that there was a polypeptide exit tunnel, and he didn't realize that there was an exit site for the tRNA. So there's lots to do. So that was what was known in the 60s. And uh, the large subunit has about 3,000 nucleotides of RNA, the largest RNA machine in the cell, every cell, and the smallest of it has about 1,500 and, and a number of proteins. It's two-thirds RNA, so it's really an RNA sort of contaminated with proteins, if you will. It's really an RNA machine that has some assistance from proteins now. <clears throat> and it's very abundant, which helps you if you want to do biochemical and structural studies. So structural studies have been going on for a number of years. Uh, Jim Lake, in 1976, published a very low resolution, that is, with very little detail, of the structure of the individual subunits done by electron microscopy using negative stain. And you can show the shape of a large subunit. This is called the crown view, because it looks sort of like a crown. <coughs> And then there's the small subunit, the head and body domain. Looks sort of like what Vinky just showed you. <clears throat> and then this is the way they get together, more or less. They snuggle up, and um, that's where it was then. And then in 1995, this was actually a review in 97, but in 1995, this is the state of play. <clears throat> uh, Joachim Frank used what's called cryo-electron microscopy. You don't stain it, you just freeze the, the molecules. And he could get shapes that have a, a little more detail, and he could approximate where the three tRNAs were, but they weren't exactly right. Uh, getting a, a, a little bit more of a clue, but really down to, not down to detail. So how did we get into this? Well, we decided uh, after we had worked on DNA polymerases, and RNA polymerases, and lots of other uh, factors involved with uh, protein synthesis, the, the enzymes to put amino acids on tRNAs, for example, that it was time to uh, work on the ribosome. And Linod Bon joined my lab in 1995, and he was the right person at the right time. And uh, he's the primary mover behind the structural studies. I decided we needed to collaborate with a long-term friend uh, and ribosome expert, Peter Moore. Uh, his, his face is a little dark in this uh, rendition here uh, because of the, the lighting. But he's got a great smile on his face because he's got a huge fish here. He's a fisherman, and he likes catching big fish. And I figured the ribosome was a big fish, so he would be a good guy. <clears throat> now, I've, I've worked uh, with Peter, Peter as a colleague. I've known, known him since he, we were graduate students together at Harvard. And so he was a wonderful collaborator. 
and then Paul Nissen uh, joined the lab from Aarhus, Denmark, uh, and Paul and then I thought were really the ones who were the primary movers on determining the structure. I'm not going to, t you'll probably be pleased to know, I'm not going to tell you in detail what it was we did that made it possible to solve this largest of uh, assemblies solved at that time. Ten times larger than the previously large assem uh, assembly solved. We used a very uh, large heavy atom cluster compound that at low resolution gave a big signal. Um, I won't tell you anything about it. It all has to do with getting uh, information that's necessary to convert those x-ray diffraction in images that Vinky showed you into a molecule. I won't talk about that. Instead, I'll just show you uh, a recent uh, structure that we got uh, you following on, on Benke's uh, crystals, showing the complicated uh, structure of the RNA with a phosphate backbone in white here uh, and bases in, in, in purple, and then the proteins scattered around the surface and the tRNA molecules uh, going in between. There's the E site tRNA and um, Let's do this again. So those, those are the three tRNAs. Decoding happens here. Protein synthesis happens down there. And again, a very complicated RNA structure. Uh, uh, and I have to say the most exciting time that we had, and I'm sure it was true with the Ramakrishnan lab as well, is when we saw what the RNA protein complex looked like. We had no idea what it was going to look like. So, here again, not well uh, uh, displayed because of the darkness of the, the uh, projected image, <coughs> is the, the RNA. This is the structure that we got in 2000. <coughs> the tightly packed RNA, again, the backbone in, in green here, and the bases in, in white, and you can, the proteins are scattered about on the surface, and you can't see very well here, but there's no protein down in this pocket, which is where the peptide bond formation occurs, and there is in here, in, in red, uh, a substrate analog that marks where the active site is. <clears throat> now, if we split that molecule in half, so we just take the ribosome, and split it down the middle like an apple, and then look at the inside, what we can see is there's where peptide bond formation occurs, and there's that long tunnel through which the polypeptide exits. And shown in white is the tightly packed RNA. You see it's really quite tightly packed considering uh, it's RNA. And inserted into it in green are bits of protein going in to fill in the cracks, so to speak. So the, question, the first question you will ask, and I'll just very briefly uh, describe our work on this because there's much too much detail for, for this audience, is what is the source of the ribosome's catalytic power? Why is it an enzyme? How does this RNA machine work? And this was done uh, by a graduate student, Martin Schmain, who uh, also did a postdoctoral study in, in Venki Ramakrishna's lab after he worked in my lab. This is a fabulous thing, Venki, that.